Okay, hello everyone and welcome again to another episode of the Love Fruit podcast. Uh, you might be watching us on YouTube as well on the UK Fruit Fest channel. Uh, we welcome you wherever you are, wherever you're watching, and we're hoping to share with you more fantastic information about uh, the benefits of raw vegan lifestyle and eating more fruit and things like that. And if that's what you're interested in, then you're, you're at the right place. And we would uh, encourage you to maybe listen to some of the other episodes we've got and watch some of the other interviews. Today, we've got a, an absolutely fantastic guest, someone who's not only been at every single UK Fruit Fest and has been at many events around the world, uh, but someone that has really led to uh, a major change in the world of the, the raw vegan, the raw food community and, and movement, who wrote the book, The 80-10-10 Diet, which for many people is a, a guidebook and a resource and a trusted reference guide for success on a raw vegan lifestyle, but not just the raw vegan lifestyle, but, but for attaining the highest levels of health, healing, vitality, performance in life. So we're going to be talking to Dr. Doug Graham and uh, we're going to be going over a number of topics today. One of them will be about something he's a real specialist in, which is fasting. And we'll get to that in a little bit, but there's so many things that I would like to um, speak to Doug about and ask questions of. Uh, we'll try and get it, get um, as many things covered as possible. So Doug, just uh, want to welcome you to the, the podcast and thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks, Ronnie. It's a treat to be here. Uh, I appreciate the, the outreach opportunity, but also just to get a chance to spend some more time with you is a pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is certainly not the first interview we've done, so people can uh, check out some of the other interviews from the past as well. But um, another thing I want to say about Doug is that Doug is uh, the, the, one of the few people in the raw food movement or the raw vegan uh, community that has worked with professional athletes and continues to work with athletes at the highest levels, taking the benefits of the raw vegan diet, moving it towards how can we use it for performance rather than just for healing and for detoxing, cleansing, as some people see it. Something that I'm seeing, Doug, is that the raw, when I got into this lifestyle, that I was getting into it with a lot of, there was a lot of people who were athletes. There were people that were looking for high energy. For, there was a lot of young people looking for um, a high, high energy, vibrancy, performance. And the 80-10-10 diet really appealed to them. And what I'm seeing now is I'm seeing more and more people who are part of this community and, and they're, the information they're finding is about detoxing, cleansing, all that kind of thing. But I fear that it's not a long-term approach that they are learning, whether that be juice fasting, whether that be uh, mono meals, mono fruit islands for long periods of time with fruits that are not potentially very high in caloric value uh, to allow the person to sustain it for a long time. Um, have, have you seen this in the raw food movement over the years, the kind of, the, 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 the I don't know, the, the difference there, the confrontation maybe a little bit between people looking for performance, people coming into it for cleansing, healing? What, what's, what's been your experience? Certainly there's a bit of ebb and flow. Uh, when I used to attend health conferences while I was in my 30s or even in my 40s, I was often the youngest person at the event. Uh, and, and the old timers who were there, people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and even 100 plus, uh, would often lament about the absence of the young people in the health movement. Right. Uh, that sh certainly shifted, and and young people have have certainly become much more involved, and and that's a wonderful thing. But and I and I don't say this with a with a heavy heart or anything. Uh, the loudest voices often get heard the most, as I say, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So 
uh, the people who are marketing stuff keep marketing. I mean, they're just, they're just so persistent and, and you know, I'm not out there hawking things. I, I put out educational material. The educational material speaks for itself. It stands up against the test of time and, and became accepted in the community as a standard, uh, 80, 10, 10, I know I've gone to festivals where there's three and 400 people and, and ask how many people read 80, 10, 10. And it was an easy 90% of the people there, you know, that, that were influenced towards raw veganism through 80, 10, 10, which is, which is great. I'm, I'm honored by that. Uh, but the, but people in general, uh, even you and I, uh, we're very susceptible to looking for a quick fix mm. and and not seeing big picture not seeing long term not seeing implications um, not always thinking about the consequences uh, you know we just want this quick fix and if people promise a quick fix it's tempting to it's tempting to jump and and see what happens and so I, I think what we'll see again is ebb and flow people will get frustrated realizing that the the quick fix didn't get them where they wanted to go it's it's i think it's very much like the number of people who try vegan or try raw food and and they do so because their former diet wasn't getting them where they wanted to go so whether they were meat eaters or whether they were cook fooders, it doesn't matter. Uh, they, they move away from that because that diet wasn't giving them the results that they were hoping to get. And then they become, let's say, a raw vegan. And then after a few months or a few years, they go back to cooked food as if it was a discovery, you know, or they go back yeah. to eating meat as if it was some discovery. And what I see is that they forget why they moved away from that stuff in the first place yeah so they go oh yeah i felt much better when i started eating meat well <laughs> uh, i've discussed this with a lot of professionals you know is there is there is it even possible and and everybody's in agreement that it would be a very rare individual indeed who who got some kind of a lasting health effect. Well, sure, you're going to get a stimulation from eating meat. I mean, you're eating pure adrenaline practically, and you're going to, you're going to get a rush from that. And, and humans are, humans are suckers for stimulation. We all love stimulation. So if, you know, you start eating food that's stimulating, uh, you might say, oh, and I felt better, or I felt something, you know, I felt more... But I mean, it's just, it's just a stimulation from the food that, that isn't really going to cut it. I think you'll see uh, kind of like what you and I talked about with strength training one time is, is that we'll see the movement continue, continue to grow, but it will, have its, it will have its ebb and flow. It'll have its moments where it's like people are really focused on health, which is the real deal. And then they'll get distracted and they'll focus on some immediate weight loss or some, um, you know, as you say, detox programs or thing, little things or, or get, they get, you know, if you don't have the training, it's easy to fall for getting um, distracted by the minutia, you know, and you start sure. focusing on a specific nutrient or, oh, I've got to get this one thing or, or yeah. and it's, it's exactly, rarely yeah. about that. It's rarely, I mean, you know, if you, if you have an iron deficiency, well, sure, you need to solve the iron deficiency, but, but um, that's, a, that's a huge, that's a really small minority of people. The bulk of, bulk of people are looking to have lasting health. They're going to have to see a bigger program than just, you know, let me supplement so, this one thing. Yeah, so let so let let's go into that a little bit uh, before we go on because i know that there's people that are that when they come into the the vegan or raw vegan movement one of the fears and worries that people have as they enter it before they know anything about it this they're questioning can i get enough on this diet 
is this diet deficient or this, that, or the other thing? And how will I get this particular nutrient, that particular nutrient? It's almost like if we imagine it as raw food, the, the raw food movement is one big party in a, in a, in a hall somewhere. In a, or, and as the people are walking in, that's their, their worries. You know, they're, they're, they're coming into the door. And they're eating Twinkies as they come in the door, yeah. right? They're, yeah. they're eating junk. They're eating hot dogs and hamburgers and cheeseburgers and Coca-Cola and beer and ice cream. Exactly. I don't, I don't think I've mentioned any foods that have vitamin C in them yet, even. <laughs> but they're going to come in to fruits and vegetables to the ultimate health foods for human beings and worry about nutritional sufficiency. It's... Oh, it's a joke, really. Well, it's that and, and the second, I guess the second thing is when people say, for example, like, uh, I mean, I was, I was at Christmas time. I was at a table with a doctor, a kid, a kidney specialist, and I was eating seven bananas in a, in a banana pudding, and it was just delicious. You know, I was eating this banana pudding. I bet Perf- it was. Perfectly yeah, he's right. Telling bananas. you about potassium, and they're saying, well. Just as well you don't have kidney disease because you certainly wouldn't be able to eat that or, or something along those lines. And I've heard that kind of thing as well where people say, well, you know, if you had, uh, uh, well, what about leading to this disease, that disease? And I'm fascinated that people don't take the step back to say to themselves, when, if you went to the hospital to the kidney disease uh, ward or whatever. Okay. How how many of those people ate got kidney disease through bananas? Wait, As yeah. of the billions in the world, yeah, it, it, it's it's fascinating that people uh, don't quite make that connection. Um, and, they're, and they're not looking for. I don't ha- I don't have the ver the wordage exactly the way I want to have it. But I've played with this over over a long period of time, where I where I I use a word and then health. Yeah. You know, so I I live health. I think health. I breathe health. I see health. I I'm searching for health. I develop my health. I accumulate health. I'm I'm looking at everything through a healthy outlook. And yeah. Gosh, it's a good thing I don't have kidney disease. It's a good thing I don't have lung disease. I mean, these things don't, <laughs> that's really not where I'm, and I understand kidney specialists see people with kidney problems, but A, they didn't get those kidney problems from eating fruits and vegetables, and B, eating fruits and vegetables is going to give them the best chance of healing from those kidney problems. In fact, um, I had a medical doctor as a client who was on dialysis. And I put him on a diet that had an inordinate amount of bananas in it, (laughs) right? But only because he was a medical doctor and we could really closely monitor his blood potassium levels. He had access to, you know, more monitoring than just your typical person on dialysis. And I said, oh, you're going to be perfect for this. This is a man in a wheelchair. He's not doing a lot of physical activity. And he didn't have total kidney shutdown, what they call, you know, renal fail, complete renal failure. Uh, He was still producing about one tenth the amount of urine that a normal human would be able to produce. Sure. But at the end of at the end of a month of working together, um, just eating fruits and vegetables, where all his doctors told him not to do it because it was going to just blow him, you know, it's going to ruin him. Uh, his kidney output was up to 50% of what a normal person should do, wow. which meant that he no longer needed to be on dialysis. Uh, and very few people understand that, you know, if if you breathe your own air, it's not just lack of oxygen that's the trouble. The, the trouble is the carbon dioxide buildup. The carbon dioxide builds up so fast, and you need to be able to get rid of that. 
but we drink carbonated beverages, which, you know, in all those bubbles, that's carbon dioxide. So we're inhaling excess carbon dioxide when we breathe, when we drink a carbonated beverage and nobody's worrying about the excess carbon dioxide because when we exhale, we just get rid of carbon dioxide as effortlessly as, you know, exhaling. Uh, when we urinate, we get rid of any excess potassium as easily as we get rid of excess carbon dioxide. The potassium only builds up in our system if you're having kidney failure. Right. I don't know the percentage of people with kidney failure, but when I look at the list of things that are killing people, <clears throat> kidney failure isn't high on the list. Right. Right. So I'm really not going to gear an entire health program around the potential that somebody might have, you know, they might be on dialysis. Uh, that's got to be a crazy small percentage of people. What I did, though, which you mentioned in the intro, was looked at a couple of key words. Uh, you know, for 10 years, I ran a health retreat where I helped sick people get well. Uh, essentially, most of them came as incurables doctors told them they had no more there's nothing else could be done for them and and i helped them recover their health and eventually it came to me that if if this program helps sick people get well shouldn't it also help well people do even better mm. or shouldn't it help mm. athletes perform even better if it's helping sick people do better it should help well people do better mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and realize that that the the word in common for all of them, which we use sort of as two different words, it's understandable. I mean, you know, in professional fields, sometimes a word can be used in one field and have a different meaning in another field. I mean, we, we use the word energy and health, and it means slightly different than what energy means in the world of physics, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and so, but the word that gets gets used by everyone is recovery. And it dawned on me at some point, I don't know, 1985 or something, <clears throat> that the factors that, that, the factors that were really impactful for recovery for an athlete were actually the same factors that were holding a sick person from becoming well. So we just started stacking the recovery factors that I was using for sick people. I started explaining those in terms of the way an athlete would apply them in order to get the same results. And, and actually at that point is when I became a, a personal recovery expert and to this day, as far as I know, I'm still the only personal recovery expert, but, uh, that's what I'm doing for, for athletes and I'm doing it for everybody else as well is show you how to recover faster, how to accumulate your health and keep the focus on health rather than disease prevention or disease treatment or any, anything along that line. I really want to, I want to think health. And as you've said so many times in, in, in your most, powerful presentations you know health isn't the only thing it, it's it's just when you don't have your health that it becomes the most important thing uh, yeah otherwise li life is you know we we go through our life just assuming health we just take our health for granted uh, it's unless funny, yeah and, and, and that's 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 actually the frustrating thing about probably you feel it as well and what you do uh I feel it with the festivals when I'm speaking to people and you know, I, I understand that everyone that's, that's got something to share or offer or a service or a product or whatever, they all feel passionate about it. But I think there is a slight difference when, when someone says to you, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just not ready to dive into this right now. And you, <laughs> and when it's, when they've come to you with these health issues or conditions or, or they're, they're looking because no one comes to the fruit festival or, or probably to you without having probably some major, major reason. And they've probably tried a lot of things out first before coming to you or before thinking about the festival. 
and it's just it's it's to to hear people saying you know that this this just uh and maybe I'll try it next year. Maybe I'll do it another time. <laughs> and you're like, but how how could anything be more important to this this to you right now? You know. Um, but I want to talk about the. Yeah, I, I look at health as the health yeah. is not only the the default state; it's the normal, the natural state. Um, you know, life life is meant to be healthy. So it's it's funny when we wish people, you know. Here, we, we drink alcohol and toast to a, a healthy life, um, but, but health to me is, is the natural state. And, and when we're not experiencing high levels of health, we have to wonder why, what are we doing that's unnatural, that's creating less than, less than optimum health. Uh, I, I do my best to capitalize on the urgency that young people have. I mean, it, teenagers are notorious for their their urgency and their ability to act on it uh, children in their single digits have even higher levels of urgency and immediate immediate needs uh, they can't always they're not always in charge enough to be able to act on it we we have to help them with their needs um uh, on, on I meet people at the other end of the spectrum, you know, in their 80s or their 90s, and once again, they have a, a sense of urgency. And, and I wonder, where did the urgency go between 25 and 75? Where's the, where's the urgency that's going to get people to conserve their health now and accumulate their health now? And, and you don't want to wait until it's all gone to start looking for more. Yeah. So I, I feel that sense of urgency. I'm... I'm I'm sure I'm as guilty as the next person for putting off something, mm. but you know, my health is my health is a priority, for sure. And uh, when I've made statements like that about health, health being the most precious thing, I've had people come back to me and they've said, "Well, I actually think the environment is the most is the most precious thing," and and you know, whatever the reasoning behind that is, and. Um, for some people, they might be concerned that eating fruit is somehow bad for the environment, you know, and, and which is a funny one. But, uh, and, and I just, I just think to them, but how are you going to affect that? How are you going to impact the environment or be a force for good in that if you're in a in bed somewhere, you know, if you don't have energy, if you die ten or twenty years younger than you, you could have the, the experts, the geniuses, the artists, the whoever who died in their thirties, forties, fifties who never really lived out their life, probably while they were living, didn't have the energy they could have had. You know, it's just a, a huge opportunity cost to bad health across human society for all of us. Well, the funny thing is there too, um, because everybody can have their priorities, whether it's animal welfare or the environment, you know, uh, world peace, whatever. Um, and I, and I, I laud everybody for having such lofty goals. I think that's, that's just great. And having those things be important to them uh, or their art or whatever it might be. Uh, but, you know, when we talk about an ecosystem, we talk about a healthy ecosystem. When we talk about a, a, a living reef. You know, we're, we want to see a growing reef, a thriving reef, a, a healthy reef, not a die, a reef that's dying off. Or uh, we talk, we, we look at the life of a jungle and we, the way you judge whether that system is thriving is to look at the health of the largest predators. You know, if the largest predators aren't there, the entire, the entire ecosystem starts to fall apart. So it, it falls out of balance without, without mm -hmm. the largest predators. So, uh, we're all here for a reason yeah but the whole thing falls apart if the health of any any part of it it's kind of you know it's whether we look at the microbes or whether we look at the macrobes um we it, every part of the system has to be healthy and it includes us it includes our environment uh, if any of it isn't healthy there's a problem mm. let's let's let me address this deficiency thing because you have been criticized by some people for not really 
talking enough about deficiency or I don't or, sell supplements. Yeah, or, or dealing with it or talking about it or um I, 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 and as I was saying, envisioning the raw food movement as a big party somewhere in a room and as people are coming in, they've got worries, concerns, fears, whether it's right for them or not, and all this stuff. And and I'm just imagining that as the for all the thousands of people that maybe come in to the front door or are approaching the front door who don't ever, who might never actually kind of stay in the movement, but a lot of the time the first person they come to as they walk in is, I, I imagine it in my mind, uh, as a guy with a flyer saying, if you're worried about su- uh, deficiencies, here's the supplements. And then a- another guy with, uh, you know, if you're, here, here's the natural remedies. Here's the herbal remedies. Here's the, you know, the um, the iridology. Here's the whatever, um, and and this is what people get confronted with. I think a lot when they come into this movement. And I think that I'm right in saying that in your experience, when you used to go to many raw food events that were thriving at one point, um, that a lot of them were based on or, or a lot of the sales at the events were products like supplement products and this particular from what I've researched looking into and I'm someone that's researched and learned a lot about communication propaganda marketing sales I've, I've looked into those things and learned about them to understand them more and what I see is these stories that have been concocted in order to sell these products that that people then because they have been told so much many people have accepted these things as being true and the, and the biggest story that has basically built the entire supplement industry is the idea that the fruit and vegetables no longer has any nutrition anymore the farmers um, are filling everything full of chemicals and um, they're they're not growing the food properly and the soil, they're not looking after their soil and, and the government doesn't care and all, the agricultural in, industry doesn't care and all this kind of stuff. And therefore you cannot trust the food in the supermarket and therefore you need to have supplements and our supplements come from a source that does care. <laughs> and, and I even said, I even saw an interview with the founder of Amway, which was, started off selling supplements and nutrition products. And he said, when we started, people didn't believe they needed it. The doctors didn't believe anyone needed them. So we had to create a need. We had to create, (laughs) and to me, that means they had to create the story. They had to create this idea. And for some reason, many people like the idea or buy into the idea. And in terms of, and that's why I'm not so convinced about these nutritional supplement products because they are just, you know, many of them are just a food product, basically. They're dried food um, or, or not even something that we would really eat as food, but they're just dried, a version of. And, and, uh, uh, and the other thing is I've, I've not, of all the raw vegans that I've met, the successful long-term raw vegans, most of them do not worry that much about deficiency. Most of them are not particularly worried about taking nutritional products and things like that. Um, but am I, would that be right in saying that, that the history of the raw food movement has always been this kind of supplement side of it that's been a big part of it? Well, it depends how far back we want to go in the history. I mean, if we go back, if we go back to the raw food movement of the 1800s, uh, supplements weren't part of it. They were just trying to get people to eat fruits and vegetables. Mm. Uh, and, and there was a big raw food movement in, in the latter half of the 1800s. Uh, there were groups of over a thousand people in Chicago meeting as raw food enthusiasts uh, at a time when Chicago only had about 50,000 people, you know, in yeah. total, in po- total population. So, the movement was very strong. It died out when people started talking about microbes and germs and bacteria and and cook everything. Mm. People were saying, cook your lettuce and cook your tomatoes. And uh, (laughs) it's just, it went a little over the top, but 
it, it effectively killed off that raw food movement. Yeah, the raw food movement recovered. I mean, it's hard to hold a good truth down and, and, and pretty much the way you described it is what I saw the, the raw food movement of the 1990s. Um, there was a really good idea going there and, the, and a lot of enthusiastic people and, and there started to be festivals. Uh, there were, there were at least six or seven different festivals just in North America and Europe in the early 2000s every year. But it started out, you know, people talking about fruits and vegetables. It's a pretty simple thing to talk about. Uh, and whether we say, you know, your intestinal flora uh, normalize when you start eating fruits and vegetables, or whether we say you're you know, we look at your blood work and see what happens there. I mean, you can get scientific about the whole thing. Um, or whether you say, look, this is how I feel, or this is how it relates to the environment. We can look at lots of reasons to promote fruits. But there's not much to sell other than a bit of education, a bit of, you know, support, some guidance. Uh, you can start to look at the psychology that people struggle with you know but eventually there's just not that much to it it's it's a pretty simple thing to say eat your fruits and vegetables get some exercise get enough sleep you know take good care of your health or it'll go away and and i listened like you to some of the marketers and the marketing and one one guy that i listened to quite a while ago was talking about how to sell golf clubs. Mm. He had like, he had what he thought was like the world's best golf club. And, 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 if, and if, if a putter sold for a hundred pounds, his putter was selling for 500 pounds. Sure. So it was crazy money and he couldn't sell it at all until he tried to sell it to golfers. <laughs> <laughs> right like the fishermen weren't buying it and the dog owners weren't buying it but golfers golf enthusiasts golf fanatics that's what the word fans means right like if you're a your fan is just a shortened version of fanatic so like whether you like football or whether you like whatever it you're a fanatic you're a fan uh the golfers they were willing to spend insane money on a golf club and he just I mean, he was living in his car. It was getting really bad. And the next thing you know, he's a multimillionaire selling, selling golf clubs to golfers. And, and what he mentioned was like, well, you, you know, you could sell. I've got, I've got a friend who makes cat magazines and he couldn't sell them at all until he realized like all his marketing has to be to cat owners, <laughs> which is a no brainer once we think about it, you know, but, but until, he, until it dawned on him that he couldn't just, you don't just tell everybody. You just tell the cat owners. And they want the cat yeah. magazine. And the golfers want the golf club. And because in a sense that a lot of people would a lot of people would make the naive assumption that if you've got if you're a golfer, you don't need golf clubs because you've already got them. If you're a cat owner, you, you already know everything you need to know about cats. You don't need a magazine. But as you're kind of saying, in reality, what happens is the person that has already bought these things, they kind of want more a lot of the time. Absolutely. And so in the raw food movement, I saw the raw food movement, which was, which was such a pure thing in the early, 1900, early 2000s, um, get taken over by people who wanted to sell stuff. It just got totally taken over by people who wanted to sell stuff. And they... Um, my prediction was that it wouldn't last. It couldn't last. It had to, and, and it didn't take very long. It took about five years. And the entire raw food movement as it was just collapsed from the outside in or from the inside out or however you want to say it. it the whole thing just collapsed until today. There are no, there is no raw food movement. There is no raw food fest uh, where there used to be there were as many as seven, as I say, happening annually. 
big festivals. Uh, and But what came out of that was uh, fruit-oriented things that either call themselves 80-10-10 festivals or fruit festivals. or uh, And now there's not only dozens of those, uh, but lots of local little fruit lucks and um, you know that whole that whole thing the leaders the leaders that have are now around are, are teaching about the value of fruit and vegetables they're teaching about actually eating raw food but the mindset you know of scarcity deficiency it's funny because because malnourishment if we look up malnourishment uh, it doesn't focus on deficiency. Uh, malnourishment is when you have too much or too little of something so that it's out of balance with the other nutrients. Right. So it's, really a, uh, it's really a disharmony. You know? right. like, um, because nutrition is, is a symphony of, of orchestrated actions and, and processes that requires a balance of nutrients and, and deficiency really isn't part of, but somehow we focused on deficiency, deficient. It's always about deficiency. And I, I for one find it humorous that we could eat a diet like a standard Western diet and which is deficient in a phenomenal number of nutrients and then switch to something like fruits and vegetables and suddenly start worrying about nutrition. Mm. where it should be the other way around the people you know the people eating at mcdonald's should be worrying about nutrition people eating out of the grocery store out of the produce section uh you have to you have to go pretty far to try to convince somebody who's eating fruits and vegetables that they have deficiency yeah so, the, so uh, going back to your point it's kind of like basically that just like in order to sell a putter you need to go and find people who've already got putters <laughs> if you want to expend it, an expensive putter you probably want to find someone that's already got a few expensive putters and Absolutely. if you want to sell nutritional products you don't go to people that you know need them like people going to mcdonald's people who are overweight people that might need something you actually go to the people who are most concerned about their health and most likely to open to make those changes to those choices which is often the people that have are investigating the raw food thing and um yeah i i i, I just i just I, i've never one of the characteristics i see in long-term successful raw vegans is they do not have that fear around supplements and around nutritional deficiencies the people that are able to stick to this have got over that or, or never really had an issue with that the people that always fall off this lifestyle are the people that were always looking for the magic bullet nutrient that's going to make them feel amazing all the time or, or, or whatever it is. Um, but certainly the people that you and I know that have been doing this for 20 years, 25 years, who don't even, it's not even a hassle for them to do this lifestyle. Um, it's just a part of their life. But their mindset is not focused on deficiency or, or anything like that as far as I can see. I, I agree with you completely. Uh, you said something earlier that I think needs a little reinforcement too, though. Uh, I had a teacher in school. And I, I love the fact that my memory works and I remember my teachers and, and what they said. And One of my teachers stressed upon us that no one comes to you with a little problem. Right. If it's a little problem, they try and solve it themselves. Yeah. Or they'd ask their next door neighbor. Uh, by the time people come to you with a problem, they've probably been to other people for this problem. And and when he was talking about being a chiropractor back in the 1980s, he said, by the time somebody comes to you with their problem, they've probably been to 23 other doctors, you know, trying to solve this. They're coming to you as a last ditch effort. And, and I certainly apply this to the raw food movement. Most mm. people who try raw foods are doing it as a last ditch effort. I understand full well that it's not, you know, it's not the first thing people are going to try. 
because they're hearing about they had to they had to go through some trial and error they had to fail they had to look a lot before they get to us and and um and you have to take that keep that in mind and and be respectful of that like who who are the people who are going to be so willing to change their diet mm. that they're willing to try vegetarian or that they're willing to go to vegan or that they're willing to even consider raw vegan, let alone low fat raw vegan. Uh, who are these people emotionally, mentally, what, what's been their history? Uh, the beauty of being a doctor is I take each person as an individual, but if we look at the group as an overall group, uh, we do see that it's people who've had issues. They've either had health issues or they've had issues dealing with their family emotionally. They have issues with food or digestion. Um, they have issues with their own body image. Um, you know, am I going to say, oh, we get all the weirdos and kooks and freaks? No, we don't get all. <laughs> we don't get all of them. Um, but. But compared, to, you know, if you if you took a bunch of mainstreamers and then you take a bunch of raw fooders, uh, the mainstreamers are going to view us as weirdos, kooks, and freaks, because just because we're eating raw food, <laughs> you know, uh, we're looking at the people on on mainstream food, going, uh, it's sad that you you know we we can't give you the enlightenment that we have. It'd be lovely to be able to turn that light bulb on and and let you see, and that's been my one of my life goals has been to expand the audience. I don't want a bigger piece of the pie. I want the pie to get much, much bigger. Yeah. And um, let's, so let's get, let's get into, I mean, I, I like the fact that we, we always get into some deep topics in, in our conversations and, uh, but that's, that's great. Hopefully for a lot of people that, that uh, have been able to follow some of these ideas and understand what we're talking about here. But we do want to talk about fasting as well. Uh, firstly, firstly uh, Doug, you've been, you're once again, by public demand, you're coming back to UK Fruit Fest uh, 2020 this year. Uh, this will be the seventh festival, I think. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 19, seven. Yeah, this will be the seventh time um, every year. And you've been a big part of the event. So we really thank you for coming back. We look forward to having you again. <clears throat> but we were talking about how at the festival, we never really make a focus on fasting. We don't really make it a big topic of, of discussion. We don't have a lot of education on it. Um, maybe a little bit here and there, but... Um, Certainly fasting for many people is important. I, I would like to start off with, with, let's look at some of the issues and the fears and the worries people have around it. For me personally, uh, my worries and concerns with, with making it too much of a focus is that it, firstly, is that some people will focus on that rather than on making the change to their diet that, that's required. Um, for some people, they're looking for a quick fix that they hope fasting will give. And, and certainly for some people, that might be the case. Um, I have concerns that there are people with, say, eating disorder background or history or tendency that are going to use fasting as a way of covering up what their, their, their real issues. So there's a lot of concerns to me about, about trying to... Uh, take the wrong or, or the, the wrong people finding out this idea, this very powerful tool and potentially using it in the wrong way or approaching it in the wrong way and coming to more harm than good as a result of it. And there is obviously some inherent dangers in it, especially if someone is doing it unsupervised. So let's address some of those things. But firstly, please define for us what is fasting? Mm. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, different people define the word fasting in different ways. And, and that's fine. Uh, I'm okay with that. I just, you know, it's like when I talk about fruits, I always talk about culinary fruits, the 
fruits as we would use them in the kitchen uh, and not the botanical definition, which a lot of people either don't have the science to understand that or, you know, we're, we're not thinking about um, a, an okra as being a fruit just because botanically it's fruit. Yeah. So in the same way, uh, fasting is a word that gets bandied about. It's It's got a long history. Uh, it's, it's something that, you know, most people know, I think, that a tremendous number of the religious leaders of the world throughout all of time uh, have fasted for clarity of mind or for sure. religious purposes, that tremendous number of religions utilize fasting yeah. as part of their programs, um, whether it's just to to demarcate a a specific time or whether whether it's to spiritually or in in bodily cleanse themselves and get a fresh start uh, the word itself uh, started out um, to mean to keep doing the same thing uh, it, it comes from the nautical term uh, when you when you tie up your boat it's called to make fast mm. and so you fasten things sure. when you fasten one thing to another or you fasten your boots closed or you fasten the boat to the dock you know you make fast with a rope you tie it there so that it'll it'll be there when you get back because it's really good if your boat's still there when you get back and um and that word fast came uh, where it's where it was meaning you keep doing the same thing um, it came in the vernacular somehow to mean to abstain from so if we open up a dictionary uh, the dictionary definition of fasting means to abstain from oddly enough yet again we use it in the exact opposite of that when we say i'm on a fruit fast well, we're not abstaining from fruit. Fruit is the only thing we are eating. We're abstaining from everything else. Mm. Uh, if you're on a if you're on a juice fast or you're on a water fast or you're on a whatever, um, you know this is uh, you know when, when people in Lent they they consider themselves not eating certain things to be a fast. Oh, I'm fasting from chocolate or cigarettes or alcohol for the month. You know, so. Um, it's odd that we use, it's flip-flopped completely the usage many times. When I use the word fast, I use a, a different concept yet again, because in the health sciences, the word fast means the deep end of rest. So rest is a relative word. When you're running as fast as you can and you slow down to a fast run, um, that's a rest. You know, maybe in the middle of a marathon, you, you just start running instead of pushing mm. and, and, the, and you take a rest and then you start pushing again. If you switch to walking, it's relative rest. If you stop and stand, it's even more rest. If you sit down or lay down or lay down and close your eyes, you just keep getting deeper and deeper into the sense of rest. If we can get your anatomy and physiology into a state of rest, if we can do what's called physiologic rest, we shut down the digestive system. If we can, if we can put you into an emotional state of rest where where you're not worrying about things, you have somebody else worrying, and 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 you're calm, and you know things are going to get better because you're just taking a rest. Uh, if we can get you in sensory rest, where where there's a view of water, where there where there's open air surroundings, where there's where there's natural curves, trees and hills and and bird sound and clean air and and all comfortable temperatures all the, all of this would be sensory rest mm -hmm. um, and at the same time participate in physical rest a lot of people think when they're fasting they should be exercising whereas i'm gonna say um should we go back just a little bit yeah just one second yeah no <laughs> we can look at different kinds of rest and go deeper and deeper when we go into the physiologic rest where 
where we let the digestive system have a rest and we're actually using less less of our organ systems fewer organ systems are involved in keeping our physiology going uh, we have physical rest we have emotional rest and sensory rest and, and and where people you know when people can let one of the first things you learn as an emt is that when you come up to somebody who's had an accident you introduce yourself and you say i'm here to help you because that puts them at ease it puts them in such a deep sense of relief that a lot of times that that one sentence i'm wow. here to help you can be the difference between life and death for a person because they can they can freak out or they can just go ah somebody else to worry and they can get into a deeper state of rest and just let people take care of you the same thing with sensory rest you know it needs to, it needs to be comfortable environment uh for your eyes all your senses you got a five and six sense it um so that you know maybe you hear bird sound you hear nature sounds you you see green uh rather than buildings you you can focus on trees and the natural curves you have a view there's typically there'd be water in the view of some kind uh we want to have as much sensory comfort as possible and the deeper you go into those states of resting mm -hmm. the the tail end the farthest you can go into maximum rest is what we call fast mm -hmm. so when you're when you're in that state like at eight o'clock in the morning or seven in the morning and you and you're deep deep in a rest mm -hmm you actually fasting at which point you get up and you move about a bit and you start doing things you eat some food and we call all that breakfast so this is this is understood around the around the world in many different languages they use the phrase breakfast uh, so i'm looking at fasting as a state of deep physiologic physical emotional and sensory rest yeah because it is during rest that the body renews itself it's during rest. We, we go all day long until we just run out of energy. We go to sleep. We get into a deep state of rest and we wake up with more energy to start again. The body has renewed itself. You go to bed and you, you can't even think clearly anymore because you're just so tired. You wake up in the morning, well rested, renewed, refreshed, ready to take on, you know, they always say like first thing in the morning is a great time to take on your hardest tasks. Uh, because you have the most ability to focus in on it at that time. So, so that rest that happens yeah. is huge. And when people are anything less than maximum healthy, then they need bigger doses of rest. Mm. So there might be times where you need an adult sized portion of rest rather than just an overnight. Yeah, so I mean, we're going to we'll probably talk about probably some of the stories you've had or the successes of people that have undergone fast, fast with yourself, and you've got a lot of experience with that. But let's let's approach this in a different way. Firstly, which is to say, who is a fast not suitable for? Who, if they came to you requesting a fast, who would you turn away or say this isn't right for you? Can you give us some ideas just so people sure. maybe can... There's a lot of people who, who either at the moment or for them, them themselves, fasting might be completely inappropriate. And I've told lots and lots of people, no, fasting isn't going to work for you, or at least it's not going to work for you now. Uh, if, you, if you do a web search, you can probably find a list of a hundred different reasons why we shouldn't fast people. Uh, or who is a, an inappropriate candidate for a fast at this time. Uh, certainly people who are drug dependent are typically not candidates for a fast because during a fast, we, we would like to be able to get into a position where we're not utilizing any drugs whatsoever. So if we're going to take them off drugs, uh, which is not something I do, they, they would have to do, um, then so drug dependent, certainly drug dependent diabetics, type one diabetics, who can't seem to make their physiology work when they get deep into a fast. Uh, they end up in trouble. I've seen it happen. I've heard about it happening. Uh, I've never heard about it working. 
So we just go, okay, type one diabetic, insulin dependent diabetic, no. Uh, people whose body weight is so low that it's already dangerous uh, are not a good candidate for a fast. I, I had a woman come to me one time, she was 50 pounds and, and, she, and I'd known her for a while. She came to me at 50 pounds and she said, oh, I hear you're running a fasting program could I come? And I said to her, uh, you're more than welcome to come. You can come and eat with me. You can come and train with me. Uh, you can come to all the educational presentations. We do about three hours a day of educational presentations. Uh, I said, you can, you can interact with the fasters, but you can't fast. And, and she sighed and said, I'm so glad you said that. I was hoping that's what you were going to say because I, I really didn't want to fast. So it was odd because it, even though I thought she was asking to fast and I said, no, I wouldn't fast her. Then she said, oh, that's really what I was hoping for. Uh, and so she came and, and, you know, did fitness training and eating and, and worked on rebuilding her health, uh, which is what was necessary. Uh, mm, Breastfeeding moms and pregnant women, uh, this, this isn't a time when you would prefer to undergo a fast because it's going to have some potentially negative effects. So these are some of the kind of serious, kind of uh, really maybe sometimes dangerous reasons for not getting a fast, you know, type 1 diabetics and so on. What about just things like, for example, if a person came to you and said, um, never been able to get a hold of my, my, I've never been able to get down to the weight I want to get to. Uh, I just want to try and lose some weight. Is, is, would you recommend, I mean, obviously it will work for them, but would you recommend that it would be the best thing for them to do or well, how would you approach that? I, oddly enough, I've never fasted a person for weight loss. Right. That, that in, in, it's been now 40 years that I've been supervising fasts and, and I've never fasted a person for weight loss. I don't think that it's a good way to, if, if a person came to me for weight loss, I wouldn't fast them. But I, but people have come to me to fast. That's never been the reason they've come. Uh, I guess it's sort of like the, the golfers analogy. You know, the people who, people who need to lose weight aren't thinking about fasting. They want to lose weight quickly, and if you want to lose weight quickly, you'll do so. You'll do far better to to be eating and active than you would to be not eating but also inactive. It's just not a great way to to lose weight. So we we could lose weight faster uh, by making a person you know just go out and take a walk and eat the right foods. So I wouldn't I wouldn't fast somebody strictly. If they said the only thing I need to do is lose weight, I, I wouldn't take them to. I might have them come to the program, and eat with me and train with me, but, but not, not fast. Uh, in the same way, you have to look at people's history, because, um, which is something that we didn't have to do quite so much. Uh, people who have fasted a tremendous amount, you can easily overuse fasting. Well, I've seen, but I've seen, for example, I've I've seen people who have said to me that, especially young women that have said they were doing a juice fast for you know, spiritual reasons or getting in touch with themselves and all that. But it it, it kind of seemed to me that it was the weight loss they were looking for, whether they said that or not. And um, I, I understand that that's very important to people, but I I I, I do agree with you that it's it's often for long term, it's not really the solution to weight loss and that people all, almost always gain the weight back if they don't address the real Well, again, here issue. we're here. Okay, so what we've done here is we've used a different definition of the word fast and then said it's the same as the one. Okay, so people on a juice fast are really just on a juice diet. Right? Hmm. They, you know, um, if we put the word yoga at the end of a phrase, it doesn't automatically make it yoga right like if i say full contact last man standing yoga uh, <laughs> page yoga um it's it doesn't automatically make it yoga and, and when somebody says i'm on a juice fast i mean 
let's face it, what they've done is they've cut out all the foods that aren't fruits and vegetables, and they're cutting the fiber out of their fruits and vegetables, but they're basically eating fruits and vegetables mm. just without the fiber. Um, is it a fast? Well, probably not. They probably aren't. Um, they're certainly not getting physiologic rest. They're probably not taking physical rest. Who knows if they're getting emotional or sensory rest. Uh, they're really not taking part in any of the kinds of things that we call fasting because they're not doing any of those four rests. And, and all they've done is they've, you know, does the juice diet work? Sure, a juice diet works really, really well uh, because you've, you know, you just can't juice a cheeseburger. So you've stopped eating the things that weren't supportive to your health. You've gone on a fruit and vegetable diet. I know a guy who, who lived on juices for years. He just ate juices. He preferred to drink his food. And, and he put up with the little issues that came from eliminating that much of the fiber from his diet because, because there's different kinds of juicers and, and most of the juicers will allow, as far as I know, maybe all the juicers will allow the, what's called the soluble fiber. They're just mm -hmm. pulling out the insoluble fiber. So uh, the body, our body needs mostly the soluble fibers anyway. So the juice, ju juicing, I, don't, I would hate to miss out on chewing and all the pleasures that come from texture. <laughs> so I, I'm not looking, you know, to juice all my food. It's too much work for starters. Uh, but the juice diet will work for that individual as far as having weight loss and, and, and still keeping the energy up which is what we said. If you want to lose weight, eat and be active. And whether you want to eat the food or whether you want to juice the food, I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just presentation styles. So, yeah, I mean, the, the other kind of things that people have brought up about fasting, um, that it will affect your metabolism, that it will deplete you rather than, you know, mm -hmm. help you with your health. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's one person that talks about the idea that uh, fasting should be body initiated. So if your body takes away your desire to eat, then that's when you should fast and you should never fast, you know, just on a schedule or whatever. Um, and I'd be interested if, if there is any potential that fasting can stress a person or stress a body over time. What would be some of your replies to that? Okay. So I start, I start with this concept, all anatomical and physiologic structures and functions vector towards health when we fast. Not most of them, all, all anatomy and physiology vectors towards health when we fast, fast, which is why I, I can't speak for everybody. I haven't met everybody, but pretty much everybody goes to sleep every night and takes six, eight, ten hours of rest, which we're defining. This is my definition of fasting is, is deep rest uh, every single day of their lives, mm. right? Because this is how we renew. This is how we recover. This is how we rejuvenate. This is how, how we heal is we get into deeper states of rest. And, and so we're not doing ourselves harm by fasting. Uh, we can, we can overutilize fasting, in which case you can do the body harm. You, you can, you can fast all the way until you start starving and, and do your body harm and, and starving isn't a good thing, but this is easy to monitor. It's easy to tell, uh, is, is arbitrary fasting. Uh, the way to go, you know, an arbitrary start, an arbitrary finish, as opposed to totally bodily, you know, listen to your body. Well, um, in an ideal world, perhaps this is so, uh, but some of us have schedules that we have to concede to or allow for. Uh, some of us work for others and we have to, you know, get permission to take a month off or find time. Uh, 
sometimes issues have been nagging for a while and, and it's just finally time to address them. I would like to comment also, you know, um, there's, there are drugs available to us today that didn't used to be available to people uh, relatively new on the market are something called antidepressants. And I've, I've seen now three people have negative reactions post fast after the fast was over when it turned out that all three of them uh, had use of antidepressants long before the fast. And so when you ask about, you know, who should or shouldn't fast, I take a pretty comprehensive history from people because at this point, if somebody has a history of antidepressant use, that might be somebody who shouldn't fast. Uh, we have to be have to be very careful about who should and shouldn't fast. And you, it's not just um, mm. it's not just something that we take lightly at all. You know, you want to look into their mental states. You want to look into their physical states, and, not, and enough into their history to know what's gone on before. Because it's not always something I've had. Nobody mentioned actually of those three. None of them mentioned mm. antidepressant use, even though I had actually asked in my form so now i not only ask but then i ask again <laughs> is what what about fasting as a lifestyle you know instead of doing a long-term fast how about you just maybe fast once a week or uh once a year or you know an intermittent fast or rather than a long-term fast what what would be your thoughts on that fasts gain momentum uh much like much like your, if we could just expand out on a night of sleep, uh, sure, you know, and and vision, you know, like the first hour or two of sleep is different than the last hour or two. You you get deeper and deeper. You can you can get more benefit. I'm mean, I'm thinking about okay, I've cut myself and I'm going to put a bandaid on for five minutes. Then I'm going to take it off for an hour, and then I'm going to put it on for five minutes, and then I'm going to take it off, and, and everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep opening. You know, I planted a tree, but I'm going to keep pulling it up every couple of weeks to see how the roots are growing. Um, there are things about fasting where we have to just let it run in order to gain its mm -hmm. momentum for the body to, because what the body does, the body works on a bunch of principles that it it heals it heals from the present time back in time. And so if you initiate a fast in order to try to get some healing happening, it starts from today and it works backwards in the, if you will, the detox or the recovery phases of things. Um, people will often say to me several weeks into a fast and they'll go, no, my, I hurt my knee 25 years ago and it's just been aching and aching today. And, and then finally after the fast and they go you know that knee problem is completely gone uh, so i find very short fasts because it takes a body it takes a body most people 18 to 36 hours to even get to the point where we would say they are fasting it's going to take them that long before I mean, it can take 72 hours. I've seen, it ta I've seen it take 96 hours, but it takes some amount of time before we can actually get into physical, physiologic, sensory, and emotional states of rest before people start to accept the fact, before their body can start to, I, I mean, I fasted a guy one time, it took 28 days for his digestive system to calm down before he could actually finally start to have physiologic rest because for the first 28 days he had a bowel movement or two or three every single day even though he was fasting he had a very very bad case of ulcerative colitis so uh, it it took 28 days in that case not just mm. 20 hours uh, but it takes time so it, if we're gonna i mean to me intermittent fasting just means that you don't eat in between meals i mean on a yeah. 
if your meals were satisfying in the first place, that's <laughs> hard to do. You know, if you eat enough fruit so you're satisfied, you probably don't want to eat for four or five, six hours anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 um, so this whole thing with intermittent fasting, it's yeah. again, I've talked about this problem before that, that people take mainstream problems and then try to, and then try to implement them into a raw food program. Mm. You know, and they'll say, okay, well, I'm going to do intermittent fasting or everybody needs more vitamin D or everybody this or that or the next thing. You know, I need to worry about my B12 or I need whatever it is. Uh, a, a whole lot of things that have been just shown to be problems, most of which revolve around overweight and the fact that there is no way to succeed on a standard Western diet. There's no way to have health be the outcome. So mm. we're constantly creating fixes, stopgap measures. Sure. Why those stopgap measures into a healthy program really doesn't work. Sure. We don't need to do intermittent fasting. We need to eat satisfying meals when we're hungry and then eat another one when we're hungry. Uh, in which case, eating in between meals, I mean, it's not something that even occurs to me. Does that mean that I'm always intermittent fasting and therefore intermittent fasting is what works so well? Well, okay, if you want to say so, but I don't <laughs> think I'm resting. Yeah. Like in between yeah. meals, I'm not resting. I'm going yeah. full tilt boogie. So I wouldn't call it, <laughs> I wouldn't even call it intermittent fasting. You know, I would call it intermittent eating. Um, but yeah. And, and another thing that people brought up was, uh, a particular person. I mean, we saw some people in the raw vegan or vegan movement go back to other kind of diets in the last few years, and some some people pointed out that a few of them had undertaken fasts. Some of them supervised, some of them, some of them not, and it suggested that there are certain gut issues, maybe related to bacterial infections, or I'm not exactly sure of the terminology, but that these things could get worse if a person fasted. Have you, have you heard anything about that? Is that something you're aware of? Yeah, I think I'm aware of all, most of the things you just mentioned. Um, when we talk about parasites, the, the body is host to a fantastic number of parasites, some of which we require mm -hmm. in order to live and some of which we want to not have in order to be healthy uh, there is a there's a parasite that's called a liver fluke and the liver fluke goes through a life cycle where it, it it's in your bloodstream uh, you got it in your you know through something you ate and you get exposed to liver fluke and then um and then it's in your bloodstream for a while but it's going to go through another phase where it's actually going to burrow out of your out of it burrowed out of your intestinal tract into your bloodstream it burrows out of your bloodstream ends up in your liver mm. uh, and you actually have organisms living in your liver um, not cool obviously not cool and if you don't eat you can hasten that process but you have to have already had liver fluke to begin with you know, right this, um you know, which means you probably were eating some very uh, i mean it's why people make bacon crispy right because otherwise you get end up with liver flukes I mean, <laughs> raw, raw bacon is not a good plan so um most bacteria but but when we when we look on a smaller level the the bacterial level i mean these guys either get the environment they need or they do one of two things they either die out or they go into a spore form where they wait uh, and, and, and a tremendous number of them can go into a spore form and just wait. And, and this is neither harmful nor helpful. Uh, if, if, you have, if you have intestinal parasites, most of those will just die off. Uh, and then, so, so for a lot of parasitic problems, fasting is the best solution because it'll create a healthy die-off, and, and then you're done with it. Uh, 
the natural solutions really just irritate the microbe. And if it's not specific, it doesn't really get rid of them. Um, it might cause some dieback, but not, not the ones that went into spore form. And then they just, you know, so you, you're creating more imbalance. Um, the, the thing about, as I said, all, all physiologic and anatomic uh, features vector towards health. And, and this includes our gut. So I've seen what happens. We've done bacterial counts on fecal matter and look at what's in people's fecal matter. And what we see going on is if you look at somebody in a mainstream diet and they're, and they're 85% E. coli and 15% lactobacillus, uh, but you put them on a vegan diet for a week. And at the end of a week, they're 85% lactobacillus and 15% E. coli, a, a total turnaround, complete turnaround back to the way it's supposed to be. Mm. It's supposed to have a little E. coli. It's just not supposed to take over. So um, I don't know the numbers of who's fasted under proper supervision, medically trained supervision, and who just fasted on their own. But I'd be willing to say most people fast on their own. Mm. Huge majority of people fast on their own. And, and this is like saying, I know how to talk, therefore I know how to be a professional speaker, which is not true. Or I know how to be a passenger on an airplane, therefore I can fly an airplane. Um, fasting, as you and I have discussed, most of the time fasting is completely uneventful. Fast just go as smooth as pie and everything is fine in the world. But when fasting gets interesting, when there's events, when there's healing crises, when people are going through some kind of a trauma, when, when they, their energy crashes or they have distress or they're having fevers or their heart rate goes to 150 and it just stays up there for an hour um, or whatever is going on. You know, when they get lumps or tumors or swellings or black tar coming out of their umbilicus or whatever it is, uh, when stuff is going on, it can get very freakishly scary. If you don't have appropriate supervision to tell you, hey, this is dangerous, let's go to the hospital, or gee, I see that all the time, don't even worry about that, just wait a few hours and it'll be done. Uh, you're in your own mind without proper training and experience, this typically leads to an inappropriate ending of the fast um, or, or dangerous outcomes. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the guy who came to me 20, 27 days into a fast. And, and he arrived in the back of a pickup truck. His wife brought him to me 27 days into a fast and he was unconscious and and she says, what can you do for him? And I said, well, the hospital's a mile down the road. You've got an unconscious man. I can't do it. I mean, what do you want me to do? Um, it's, it's not something that I would even begin to think of starting to, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. It's completely out of my realm of mm. training. I said, take him to hospital for sure. You know, but so, so we have to look at the appropriate and inappropriate, but the, but the, the awareness of when it's, this is a medical, um, we learned in school what was called red light, green light, and amber light. You know, a person hemorrhaging, a person hemorrhaging is a red light situation. It doesn't matter where they're hemorrhaging from. This, this is a red light, you know. Uh, when fevers get above a certain temperature, but I've had moms call me up with, my child has 102, what should I do? Well, 102 isn't, isn't a red light situation. What you should do is you just sit and wait and let it run. The body's running a normal fever. Um, so the same thing with fasting. Not only are years of experience incredibly valuable, but so is medical training. And I, I wouldn't want anybody to, because... 
from the questions that I've asked people, I'd say an easy 90 to 95% of all fasts that people do on their own end because of fear and they end inappropriately, which brings us to either where you were going or what you've already asked, which is the most crucial part of a fast is the breaking of the fast, not the fast. When people tell me they have problems after a fast, it's almost always because, almost, not always, but it's almost always because they broke it inappropriately. And this is where having guidance and, and somebody experienced uh, really, I mean, in many ways I feel my work only just begins when people start to break their fast. Mm -hmm. because this is when they're going to really require um, proper input. I don't know if you ever heard, there was a city in Russia where um, the, the city was put under siege in a war and, and they were going to starve them out. You know, they're just going to, of course. Yeah. Them, yeah. Right. They're going to starve them out. And, and what happened was winter set in mm -hmm. and they're starving, but winter set in and, and, the city was walled on three sides. It was impregnable. But on the fourth side, there's a river. And when winter set in, in the, in the dead of night, everybody in the city left by walking across the ice to the other side of the river and escaped from the siege, mm -hmm. which was great. And then they walked a couple more miles to the next town where they were welcomed with food, lots of food. It was a huge party and almost everybody died from eating oh appropriately God. after having been so hungry for so long. Jeez. So you don't want to really put yourself into that sort of a situation. But, but when you haven't eaten for a long time, uh, hunger's going to come. You know, I mean, if you haven't eaten for a long time, it, it's a really good idea to have somebody who can say, okay, well, now is a good time to eat this, or now let's have this, and, and reintroduce foods uh, in an orderly and intelligent fashion so that we can get back to being satisfied with each meal and being making good friends with fruits and vegetables and getting your... You know that little, that little child's toy that's two pieces of string with a man that goes ding, 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 sure. pull on one and just climbs up. Well, that's what you got to, you got to create that balance between food and exercise, food and exercise, food and, and rebuild people back until they're fully functional so that they can uh, go back into their daily activities. Cause from a deep rest, uh, you know, it takes, it takes a few days to emerge. Typically well, I allow half the length of the fast to emerge from the fast. So we've gone over some of the, the, the worries and the negative sides of the, the people that shouldn't fast and things like that. So how about we quickly talk about what would be the ideal candidate for a fast? Um, who would be the person that would benefit from it most that uh, needs it more than others? Or I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how to put it, but... Mm -hmm. And, and no, your, well, if your mindset, if you if you got ten people like this, that would be the perfect group of people for you because you know that you would they would all have an exceptional experience. What what would be the, the the kind of best audience for you? Okay, so um, this is meant to be as funny as it sounds. Uh, if I had ten people, they would all have arthritis. Mm. Or they would all have heart disease. Right. Or they would all have high blood pressure. Or they would all have type 2 diabetes. Or they would all be professional athletes. Or they would all have infections. Or they would all have psoriasis. They would all be health seekers um, who were already relatively healthy young people, but just coming from a mainstream hmm. world. Yeah. Um, there are few conditions that don't respond well to fasting. I mean, we mentioned several, but that's actually most. Whereas there's 
hundreds of thousands of conditions that respond beautifully well to fasting. So we have to, uh, but I, I've often said, like, if I could just have a clinic of only arthritics, I mean, every single one of them would get well. But the same could be said for type 2 diabetics, and the same could be said for, for people with various types of heart disease. And, and uh, you know, it just seems like there are few things that won't respond well in the same way that all of those people go to bed every night. Mm -hmm. For the exact same reason that we go to bed every night, we're looking at a bigger version of that, an, an accelerated, advanced, uh, enlarged mm -hmm. version of a good night's rest. We're going to take we're going to take a couple of weeks uh, and take a rest. It's, uh, we're not talking about, and we're not we're not talking about huge periods of time. I, I'm not a fan of the longest possible fast. I want mm. the fast to be as short as possible. Mm but as long as necessary. Right. And I understand full well that if you fast for a month, which would be a long, long fast, mm -hmm. but if you fasted for a month, it's only 10% of your year. It's only 1% of your life. Sure. I'm sorry. It's only 1% of the decade. It's only 0.1% of your life. Sure, sure, sure. You know, how you eat and how you live is the important stuff here. Yeah. But the fast is just as important. Uh, so I, every part is important. So I, I, another question I would ask on top of that then is I've met some people who, and, and obviously I, I can't know exactly what people did, but I've heard people that claimed, you know, they were eating a healthy vegan diet or a raw vegan diet. And I don't know exactly what they were eating, but, they had, for example, one man was had had arthritis since his his late teens, and he'd been on a path of health and yoga and different things and raw foods, and he said that all those things made a difference, but the only thing that got rid of the pain for the first time ever was a long-term fast, water fast. Absolutely. And I can see that. are there some things that you would suggest that only that on, like they would have to fast potentially to fully heal from or recover from and that healthy diet alone wouldn't be quite enough? Or what would you think there's about a, that? There's a lot of situations that are like that. There's a tremendous number of situations that are like that. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, your liver and kidneys uh, do a fantastic job for you all the time. But if you can take a period of time where you're not introducing more work for the liver and kidneys and just let them do the work on the body that they already have, they can play catch up in a way that they simply can't do when they're the day's physical activities. Uh, so, I mean, there's plenty of clients that have come to me and, and I said, okay, well, you know, after the fast, if you want to have lasting results, you're going to be eating fruits and vegetables. So let's eat fruits and vegetables before the fast. Let's, let's overcome that problem. Let's make friends with smoothies and let's make friends with eating various types of fruit uh, and, and get comfortable with those lifestyle changes and see how much your body heals. And maybe you can show that the fast is unnecessary. Uh, but for a lot of things, you know, if you breath till you die, but you do it in intermittent intervals, 15 seconds here and 15 <laughs> seconds there, you're never going to get there. <laughs> you know, it's just not going to happen. You'll never build up the momentum. Uh, if you drive a car in first gear and then stop the car and then drive it in first gear and then stop the car and then drive it in first gear, you're never going to get up to 60 or 80 miles an hour. It's just not going to happen. Um, Fasting needs to go through the gears too. It accelerates uh, as the program continues. And, and day five and day 10, you're getting more and more benefits 
uh, as the fast accelerates, um, I'll say like a runaway train, you know, it's, it's, it's building up momentum. And as it does that, you just get more from it than you ever could from a series of short fasts. You'll never, you'll never get sure. there, even, which is what we do every night, right? Uh, in the course of a month, you went to bed 30 times, you had yeah. a series of short fasts. Um, or if you're intermittent fasting, as they love to call it, then you had three short fasts each day. Yeah. You had 90 fasts, but it's not going to be like having one long fast. But I want people to fast as short as possible to get the desired effect sure. long and, enough to do so. And just to make it clear to the audience, we're not talking about dry fasting as part of your program. No, almost, almost any, uh, if I had to call it something, I'd call it, and again, you know, it's funny with our use of the words, but we call it water fasting or water only fasting. Um, we're, we're technically water is the only thing we're consuming. So it's the one thing we're not fasting from, but that's just the way the word works. Um, dry fasting. I, I look at dry fasting as being the, not quite the ultimate dangerous fast. It's not the world's most dangerous fast. Um, it's, it's probably the world's second most dangerous fast. Um, the, the salt fast would be more dangerous. Okay. You know, where the only thing you consume is salt. Jeez. <laughs> Which would be like an accelerated dry fast. Or, or perhaps the most dangerous fast is the free fall fast. You know, where you jump out of an airplane and you fast until, <laughs> I mean, you know, um, and I don't mean to be disrespectful of it. Uh, I, I can't imagine a more danger in, in I, I don't know the year, but in Mexico City, there was an earthquake. Uh, people were survivor adult survivors were pulled out of the wreckage for seven days nobody talked about having experienced health benefits from dry fasting for seven days or six or five or four <laughs> right These people were pulled out in in it was it was extreme health yeah. deficit yeah. and trauma and and really bad for them uh, i can't imagine intent uh, there's hundreds of books written on the need for hydration and the, the benefits of hydration, the deficits of dehydration to intentionally dehydrate the body goes against all logic, all science, all, all health practice. Mm. We would ne we would never want to dehydrate the body. Now I understand there are some, there are some uh, religious fasts where people will go 24 hours without water, uh, without food, without water. But even then, um, there's special dispensation made for the old, for the young, for the infirm, for people who must work on that day, even though they choose to try to fast. Uh, there's special dispensation yeah. for water to be consumed and for food to be consumed for people who need it. And, and maybe they'll only go for six hours or eight hours or 12. Uh, this is not the same as going days and days dehydrating the body intentionally, potentially harming kidneys. Uh, dry fasting is to be avoided. Uh, we, we had a very sad wake up call this year, but I've said it before. People will die. People have died. People will die and people will continue to die as they dry fast. It's a very dangerous practice to be avoided. Thanks for your clear message on that. And, uh, Obviously, you've spoken about, about that in the past a lot. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I hope for many people listening, that's covered a lot of the information. Maybe you can just give us some stories of things that have happened, that, that fast recoveries, so, miraculous events, or whatever you want to call it. The lady came to me. She called me up on the phone. She lived. She lives in the center part of the United States, wants to come and fast. Um, she had a pretty heavy Central American accent. 
and and I talked to her a little bit. Turns out she's a massage therapist, 60 years old, and she's got serious arthritis to the point where she can't do massage anymore. Uh, her ankles and wrists are so bad that when she goes out for a walk, which is something she does every day, her practice, this is a, this is a woman with a lot of intestinal fortitude, as they say, right? Because her practice is to walk away from home. She can't get very far because of the arthritis, but she walks until she falls down. Then she crawls home. Jeez. Right? And she's known on, in her hometown to be the lady who crawls home every day and, and, and refuses help. So she came and fasted, and, and uh, at the end of the fast, uh, she could walk. She went for a walk with me for four hours. No problem with her ankles. Went back home to her massage practice. No problem with her wrists. Um, this is day in, day out, common, just right. common. Um, I have a, a, a friend of mine. She's 77 years old. She fasted with me uh, when she was 65. She had heart problems for which the doctors could not come up with a solution. She had what ex what's ex called tachycardia. Her heart would race sometimes for hours on end. Her mm -hmm. heartbeat would be above 150 while she's lying in bed. And um, doctors just couldn't come up with anything that seemed to solve the problem. Uh, they told her she was going to die. And she came and fasted and and she did. She experienced a bit of tachycardia, not a ton, but she did experience some tachycardia even during the fast. And then it got to a point where she went a week without having any tachycardia. She hadn't gone a week without that in, in a decade. And so eventually we broke the fast, put her back on foods, got her on fruits and vegetables. She's now 77, close friend of mine still, just recently wrote a book. Uh, she's out on lecture tour at 77. I mean, this, this is way cool stuff, right? Um, I fasted lots of healthy people, world-class athletes, and, and seen just no, nothing but improvements in performance. Uh, we had a guy with blood pressure that was so high that on the strongest blood pressure medications available, in fact, I had two people on the strongest medications available, uh, both of whom fasted with me, got completely off the medications and went home with completely normal 110 over 80 blood pressure uh, and maintained it just by eating fruits and vegetables afterwards. Uh, one of those late, one of them was a lady who continued to eat fruits and vegetables and is still in good health today. The other one is a guy who after two years said, I would rather eat what I want to eat than be forced to eat fruits and vegetables just to have low blood pressure. Mm. And so he went back onto his former diet and his blood pressure soared. He went back on meds and within six months he was dead, mm. uh, which was his choice. Uh, it was a shame too, because he had, he had an incredibly wealthy man, had a collection of 21 of the world's finest Corvette Stingrays in his garage. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a shame not to be able to enjoy all those Corvette Stingrays. But his choice was, he said, food was more important than his health. And he proved that it was. Um, you know, but to, for me, time after time, the, the thing, that, thing that motivates me most is, is helping people with their health. I mean, this is something to which I've, I've dedicated myself for a lifetime. Sure. Helping people reach their health and fitness goals. Uh, and, and it still is tremendously rewarding to me if people think maybe now's the time to fast, uh, I'm happy to discuss with them. A lot of people come to me to fast and I tell them, no, fasting is not appropriate for you or not at this time. But if fasting is appropriate, um, you know, I've got the, I've made the time and the place, uh, February 28, February 29, sorry, February 29 through March 28 of this year. And I'm going to take a small group, I'm going to be very personal with them, 10 people maximum, and 
let them experience the joys of fasting. It's, it's not, we're not looking to set records for the longest fast. Most people will probably only fast roughly two weeks mm, mm. Uh, during which they will get profound health changes. And if people want to fast a little longer than that, they can, uh, we can make arrangements so that it happens, but it's, uh, not only just, it's not just a chance to get out of winter. It's not just a chance to experience fantastic in-season tropical fruit. Sure. It's going to be a chance to rebuild your health like nothing else will. And, and to me, the miracle of fasting, it worked for me. I, I fasted a few times in my life. Um, I don't want to see people overuse fasting. It becomes, it's a negative. But when it's done properly, when, when it's supervised properly, when the recovery is, is done appropriately, uh, as I say, I've had some people come, I, I don't just call it even fasting in Costa Rica, I call it fasting and feasting. Some people come just to feast the whole time. They want to train, they want to learn, they want to, they want to uh, eat really well, and they're welcome to do that too. Excellent. So I'm guessing that if, if this has piqued someone's interest, they can go to foodandsport.com and there's an application form and they sure. They apply, they apply first so that I can have time asking questions if I don't know them, um, clarify health history and clarify their reasons and make sure that it's appropriate in every way. Uh, if you want, I don't even know if we can provide a link right there, but they can certainly go to Food and Sport, just click on retreats and right. fasting will be the first thing that comes up. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, definitely, uh, whatever you're going to do, make sure you get some advice uh, on fasting. Go to, if, if you listen to this, um, whether it's Doug or someone else that's another professional who's got a lot of experience in this before you uh, go forward in it. And we're also glad to say Doug's going to be coming back to UK Fruit Fest. Well, I'm excited to this be here. Thank you for inviting me. The 26th to the July to the 2nd of August, so that's going to run over eight days. Doug will be teaching every day, fitness classes every day, uh, discussion groups every day, possibly even a food demo or two or three That'd that be he'll fun. be running. Yeah. Uh, so you'll get a lot of access to Doug there as well, a chance to um, uh, learn a bit more from him personally, ask him some personal questions. And I know for me personally, getting around people like Doug and the other long-term raw vegans was something that really helped me out because I was able to sit and watch how you did the diet or watch how you approached it and, and the lifestyle and that taught me a lot. So com coming to events and things was, was, was great for me. So um, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk slash registration to find out more information about that. Um, we've got on, this has been quite a long interview, although I, do, I don't mind that. I think we had a lot to cover and it was important. The, maybe the last thing to address for some people would be um, that there are stories out there connecting deaths to fasting centers or fasting retreats. Um, I think even yourself, you've been connected with a person who claimed that they nearly died at your fast, whatever that means. Um, you're certainly not scared to speak about that. You're not avoiding that. Um, would you be happy to maybe talk about that or comment on that? Or, or what's, what's your reply to people, I'm sure, that have brought that up to you before? Fasting is serious business. It's, it's not something I take lightly. It's why, I, I, like, as you said, professional supervision. I mean, I mean, a person has to be medically trained to really provide proper professional supervision. Um, fasting physiology is such that it's so different from, so different from our normal physiology. If, if you do blood work on a person during a fast, and, and there are professionals who do that. Uh, if you show that blood work to someone from a mainstream training in a hospital, they're going to look and say, this is, this is deadly or near deadly or, you know, near death. Um, sodium goes quite low and that's normal for a fast. Uh, 
other things change. Um, blood sugar goes a little, goes a bit low and, and, and then just levels out there. Uh, but there are various things that, that change. You look at a person's blood. Um, I've, I've had, I've had lab specialists from hospitals say, well, you know, this, this person's lucky to be alive. Um, and, and they were thriving. They were doing fantastically well. But from a lab, you know, uh, from my perspective, I'm, I'm thinking that most people eating in grocery stores, eating a mainstream diet, are having near-death experiences practically every day. They're so, <laughs> they're so dehydrated that they're practically dead. Um, they're so devitalized that they're practically dead. Uh, I look at the energy levels, uh, the sedentary lifestyle, the obesity, and I go, wow, they're practically dead. Um, they're not active participants in life at this point. And, and so, I mean, I can't address what near death was. It certainly didn't happen with me or, or, or under my supervision. Um, but maybe later in a hospital near death, I, I just can't say. Um, uh, and, and just to point out that there is a hospital nearby your location if ever, anything did happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about 20 minutes drive. And, and there would have been no... And it, so if anything had happened like that, there would have been... They would have been able to get we can medical get to care hospital. if that if that was necessary yeah, or whatever. We can get to a hospital really quickly. The, um, the facility I use, the owners live on the premises. They have a truck. They're happy to drive somebody into town if need be for anything. I mean, we drove somebody into town last time just because they needed some female hygiene product. Mm. Um, and we, you know, we're on, we're on good. We have access to get to town if need be. It's easy enough. The road's paved and it's easy to get there. But, um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, I, I had a, I never actually had anybody die during a fast. Um, but I have had patients come to me. I mean, I had a client come to me one time and, and I never, he didn't feel well when he got to me. He came, he came, it was a four hour flight and, and then he didn't feel well. And I said, you know what, before we start, let's, let's get a little bit of lab work on you. And I took him down to the, to the local hospital and said, let's get some lab work. We got the lab work. The lab work came back uh, showing kidney problems. And he ended up going directly into the hospital, never fasted at all. Spent a month in a hospital sorting out the kidney problems. And then eventually, and then went back home because that's all he had allowed. He was only coming down for a month anyway. Mm. Um, but you know, back home they hadn't they hadn't spotted the kidney problem, so he had to come to me. Uh, I've I've had people come with heart problems. I mean, you know, you're working against the tough odds, right? Because because everybody dies eventually. You don't know when their time is up, and 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 typically you're not getting the healthiest people in the whole world coming to fast. You're getting people with health problems. Uh, as far as I would never ever publicly discuss any individual's private personal health matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's all kinds of ethical codes that, that say I can't, I can't, shouldn't, and I wouldn't, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, get, get into individual's personal health matters. So even when I say, okay, well, this person came and fasted uh, with a heart problem and then post fast recovered for several weeks with that heart problem. But eventually that heart problem that had been there for 20 years, um, caught up to them and they died. Uh, but they didn't die with, right. They got ill with me and, and I brought them to a hospital and then they spent some days in hospital and then eventually did die. Um, I'm still on close terms with even with that person's uh, partner. Uh, 
I had another guy, I had another guy who died of AIDS uh, that had been a client of mine six years prior. And, and I'm, and I'm still close with his parents, you know, years later, uh, get Christmas cards from his parents uh, because they, and they wrote to me and said, well, you know what, of all the people who cared for our son, uh, you took the best care of him. Mm. Really feel like he died because of his medical care, not um, in spite of it. Yeah. So, uh, but I know it's serious business and it's, and it's a high, high responsibility. I can't imagine a, a bigger responsibility. It's part of why I take such good care of myself is so that I can be clear enough that when I'm taking care of others, I'm, I'm, I'm on top of things as best as I possibly can. I'm not omniscient, you know, and I'm not failure proof. Uh, but, but as we say, most fasts are uneventful. Most fasts go well. If you do a proper screening, you've, you've eliminated most of the potential problems mm -hmm. or most of the potential problem fasters. Uh, but at the same time, I want to help everybody I possibly can. And so it's hard to say no to somebody just because they might be a problem for me. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's not a great reason to tell somebody, oh, no, I won't fast you because you might be a problem for me. Sure, sure. <laughs> so I, I don't want to do that. Well, well, I mean, thanks for addressing that. And, and obviously, um, you know, none of us make it out of this world alive. So we've all got to take care of ourselves and make, <laughs> and make our own adult decisions about things. And, and if, if, as you're saying, I think maybe one of the, one of the uh, drawbacks that maybe you've had as well is that you, I, I'm not sure if it is possible or not for you to demand the medical records of someone and therefore they might have told you or missed out things or told you things that, that weren't true or, or because That's they... I've had, I've had people outright lie to me. I mean, I had an had a insulin-dependent diabetic come to fast and she swore she hadn't used any insulin for 90 days. And uh, two days into the fast, her blood sugar level started to go up uncontrollably. There's nothing we could do to stop it. And I said, look, before this gets dangerous, let's go to the hospital. So I took her to the hospital the morning of the third day of fasting. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're gone. And... Um, and I took her to the hospital and she spent an overnight, just one, but she spent an overnight in the hospital. And when I went to go get her the next morning, um, and all they did, they gave her a ringer solution, which is an electrolyte solution and it brought her right out of the problem. But it's not something that I'm allowed to give, you know, in a home setting. So um, when I saw her the next morning, she, you know, I said, what happened? And she explained to me, what was going on and 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 I said so you were actually still using insulin and she said she said yeah I was still very much dependent mm -hmm. on insulin and Jeez. um I said so why did you tell me you hadn't you know you weren't and she, and she said well the same thing happened to me 14 years ago with a different fasting supervisor so I knew you wouldn't take me if I told you that I was still on insulin mm. I go well, yeah, well, I wouldn't take you for a reason because you're going to end up in a hospital. <laughs> you could have died. I mean, this, this really wasn't. Yeah. It's not only not just about you, but it's about me as well. Because if something goes wrong, I could fast a thousand people with spectacular results and then have one go wrong. And the one that goes wrong is going to make all the internet news yeah. for the rest of my yeah. life. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> yeah. you don't hear about the other thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those are just uneventful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> so anyway, uh, I think we've uh, this has been one for people who are in depth into their uh, their health journey. Thank you. And Thank you for providing the opportunity. Yeah, we look look forward to get some feedback on this one, and we've we went a bit further than before. I want to recommend to everyone, regardless, maybe fasting isn't right for you right now, or it's not the the time for you, but. If you're on this journey, on especially the raw vegan diet, you need to go over to foodandsport.com or uh, at least go to amazon.com and get the 80 to 10, get Doug's books and study his books because these are the books that will help you really 
get a handle of the species specific diet that we're that we're um, designed or most optimally designed to eat and that will change your life and change your health for the better and if you go on foodandsporter.com there's a number of different products as well that I personally recommend um, from having uh, listened to these programs the perfect health program and some of the other programs that are on Doug's website you should definitely get those and um, these are not things that, that, that we sell or, or get anything back from. These are just a personal recommendation um, from us to, to you to go and do that. And yeah, and you can go to foodandsport.com slash retreats and check out if that's right for you and do the application and, and go through all that. Um, and Doug, what, what, what's happening in the future? What else are you doing? Any other news you've got you want to share with us? Um, life is good. I'm, I'm still coaching people who want to become health coaches. So I do a mentor program that, that is thriving and people are, people are, uh, getting the benefits they want to get. I mean, it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one custom design mentor program mm -hmm. to help people become successful health coaches. And, and I have a good time with that. And, and I love the challenge of, of helping each person grow to the, to the point where they can responsibly coach others in their health. Sure. Uh, I know it's, it's, there's great need for this. And, and if there was something that I really want to leave behind me, uh, it would be that there's that many more health coaches out there uh, where, where there was a time where I was the one you know, and then now there's many and I, I want to leave as many as possible behind me. Um, I'm working, I'm still working with Michael Porter Jr., which is a ton of fun, very rewarding for me. Uh, it's, I, I love that he's willing to give 100% and so I'm happy to give 100% to him. So let Michael, me ask you about Michael because there was a, there was an article that said that he'd went away from his vegan diet and that he'd tried out meat and stuff. And what, what was... Have you seen I mean, any Michael, of that? Michael was raised as a vegetarian and, and became sure. a vegan um, in his late teens. And, and now he's subjected, you know, to a lot of new influences um, in the world of NBA. He's a rookie in the NBA this year and setting the NBA on fire. Um, but he's being, you know, the, the team has a comprehensive health program, uh, on their own, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people give him input and tell him to try this, that, or the next. Sure. Um, I was just out there uh, with him, living with him for the better part of a month, and and feeding him fruits and vegetables five and six and seven times a day, uh, <laughs> and and uh, I. You know, I, I've, I've struggled with this definition for a long, long time. What makes a person a vegan and what makes them not? Uh, you know, I guess I, I can't say what Michael is eating today, but certainly when I was there, he's eating fruits and vegetables. Um, has he had a bite of anything that wasn't a fruit or a vegetable? You know, did he have any meat? ever in this whole last five years that I've been involved? Um, probably, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not worrying about that. What I'm worried about is what he does day in and day out, what he's doing mostly, what he's doing all the time. Sure. Uh, you know, he's taking it, he's taking, I mean, he's flying 200,000 miles this year too. Sure. Uh, and that's, that's really hard on your health to fly 200,000 miles. He's, he's on the, on the Denver Nuggets, they fly more miles than any other professional team in sport due to their location and the NBA schedule. So um, mm. that's a lot of flying. That's just a whole lot of flying, especially when you figure that almost all of it is short haul flights. So it's, it's a fantastic number of, of trips. Sure. Uh, and this is really hard on, on a human being. Is it worse than eating a bite of meat? I don't know, I'm not saying. But uh, he lives in the city. Um, even though Denver's a pretty clean city, it's not a city 
it's not known to have the best air. It's got some of the worst air in the country, in fact, when they have their inversions. So, I mean, we have to look at the overall health program. Sure. Overall, as a 21-year-old, um, he's taken spectacular care of himself and learning how important it is to continue to improve doing so. So I'm looking forward to him. Excellent. Um, and That's excellent. His commitment growing as he learns how important it is to take superb care of himself. Excellent, uh, excellent. Yeah, there's lots of lots of fun things going on. I'm still still working on my next book, uh, and and uh, you know, in my own my own personal health, I'm I'm still making some progress, uh, enjoying my strength training very very much, and getting back into doing a little bit of cardio, mm. and and having a good time all the way around with my own fitness. Fantastic. So yeah, it's well, fun, well, all, well, fun all the way. Around. Excellent. Thank you so much for giving us this time. And uh, for everyone that's been listening, um, please feel free to share this or comment or rate it or whatever you want to do. Uh, we'd appreciate any support you want to give to this. If there is someone you think this would be uh, relevant to, why not share it with them? Why not send them a message and say that you think this might be, uh, might be relevant to them? I know that well, a lot of us have loved ones out there that have health conditions and issues and maybe this is the right message that they need to hear. So don't, don't feel scared to share it with them uh, at the very least. Hopefully they'll learn something. Um, the Love Fruit Podcast, please uh, have, have a listen to some of our others. Uh, you can check us out Spotify and iTunes and I think Google Podcast and different places. So this will be going out all over the place. Um, so yeah, uh, feel free to listen to some of the other interviews. And if you're interested in the UK Fruit Fest, go to fruitfest.co.uk slash registration for information on the event. And we do have a store as well. If you want to support us with buying a t-shirt or something, then you can go to fruitfest.co.uk slash shop. And for more information on Doug, foodandsport.com is the website and food and sport on YouTube for a lot of free videos with Doug's lectures and, and information. And you simply must get his books and educational materials. That's, that's going to make a huge difference for you on this lifestyle. So thanks for joining us, Doug. And thanks for having me, Ronnie. Really appreciate uh, it immensely. And I'm sure we'll see you again. We'll interview you again soon. And we'll see you at the Fruit Fest uh, this year as well.